I'm very glad to, to be here and I'm very honored uh, to meet uh, the great artist um, who's uh, really a legend actually, so I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we are going to have uh, this little conversation, but of course you are invited to, to join us. So if you have, uh, uh, we'll have some, some time afterwards, af after our conversation uh, for you. But if you have any questions, uh, well, earlier, then just don't be shy and ask them. Yeah, so let's, it's very intimate, it's a very small but devoted audience. <laughs> so, um, so don't be shy and, and join us, okay? If you have any, any questions and if you want to join the conversation. So, um, okay, so uh, let's start. <laughs> uh, so my, my first uh, question is actually, uh, maybe not one question, it's a, like a problem. Because uh, um, I had this well honor to, a few years ago to speak to Jonas Mekas, who's a legendary uh, Lithuanian-born artist who actually, uh, in a way, I, I, I don't know if you agree that he sort of created American art, film avant-garde. Uh, no, I don't really. agree. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> But uh, sure, people, yeah. sure, I tell but, you why? Yeah, but, or okay. do you want to finish this? No, no, up? just yeah. go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, I think uh, Jonas, is this on? Is this on? Hello? I think so. Mm -hmm. Check. Uh, so, uh, I think Jonas Mikas um, did a lot to contribute to avant-garde film in, mm -hmm. the United, in the United States and internationally. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the American avant-garde, I think we have to look to Maya Darren. Mm -hmm. yeah. And even before that, to James Sibley Watson, uh -huh. who did Fall the House of Usher in 28, mm -hmm. you know, and... Um, and actually you rediscovered him with Sanctus and also your documentary. And Nitrate kisses, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and you know, Lot in Sodom, mm -hmm. which was mm -hmm. a queer film, yeah. was shown in, uh, I was shocked to read this, it was shown in Times Square mm -hmm. in 1933 without any censorship mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. But it was sort of, uh, I think before Makers, it was sort of scattered, there were people, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but he was a person who, in a way, uh, gathered all the people together and then promoted this, which was kind of funny because he told me that he, uh, well, I asked him, well, do you feel like being uh, more Lithuanian or American? And he said, no, I'm not American, I'm New Yorker. But whenever I go outside New York, I'm just a foreigner. Yeah? But actually my question is, uh, I asked him uh, to, uh, Define. Oh, there we go. Wow, that's I spectacular. Knew it wasn't working. <laughs> that's spectacular. <laughs> uh, so, so I asked him about his definition of um, experimental film, yes. and he said, "There's no such thing." He said, "Well, scientists make experiments, and uh, I do not really believe that there is something like experimental film." So, I wonder if you agree with him or you think there is something like experimental film. <laughs> well, I definitely uh, think there is some, there is experimental film. When you begin a process like uh, with Sanctus, which is moving x-rays of the human body that Dr. James Sibley Watson shot in the 50s and then I was able to use that material, my experiment was to try to put a halo around the body, the skeletons, mm -hmm. and to use secondary colors of like orange, lavender, turquoise, not red, blue, and yellow, mm -hmm. but to be subtle. Because the interior of the body, which is mostly water, mm -hmm. is um, if you look inside and you see the organs floating around, it's very quiet and meditative. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to celebrate our body, not the way we usually see it. That was an experiment. I had to do many trials mm -hmm. and fail and try again mm -hmm. to try to get everything the way I wanted it. So 
I, I think there is experimental mm -hmm. film, yes. Yeah, I was quite disappointed with his answer because uh, what I do for a living is teaching experimental films. So in a way, you could <laughs> lose your job. I could lose my job. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but later, well, he replaced this idea of experimental film with uh, the cinema of authors. So he said, he said I'm, um, I'm an author, so I'm a person who, in a way, uses a camera like uh, a pen. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe. Uh, th this is just words, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, uh, he's yeah. speaking for his own kind of cinema, yeah, you know, as probably. well. Yeah. So, you know, he mm -hmm. doesn't see his work as experimental, but yeah. authoritative, authorit well, yes, yeah. authoritative too, mm -hmm. but authoral, I don't know what the word is. Yeah, in English. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like author. Yeah. Uh, it's a French <laughs> concept. A writer of yeah. images. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the se second question related to, to this subject is, uh, h how do you see yourself in the tradition of uh, American avant-garde? Because um, I in your early career, uh, you, you made uh, a film, and unfortunately I haven't seen it, but uh, this one, uh, this was the, the, the one on Brackage. Uh, and then you made another film about his wife. Uh, so so I, I wonder if, if he is really kind of important for you in, in, in which way. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, I was very drawn to international cinema um, when I was just 30 years old, I hadn't seen cinema, and so I saw Sajit Ray, subtitled Bergman, and I thought, oh, here's an intellectual cinema. Um, and then I went to a Cinematheque in San Francisco, and I saw the film of Stan Brackage called Dog Star Man, yeah. in which he walks up a mountain to cut down a tree. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about 45 or 50 minutes, I think, and it changed my worldview. When I left the cinema, I saw the street around me, the lights, the trees growing, the pavement differently. Yeah, yeah. And so that was fascinating mm -hmm. to me. And I also was taking a class where we saw everything Brackage made mm -hmm. up until then. So mm -hmm. an early film is uh, dedicated to him and he's in it, Brackage song. Song of the Clinking Cup, I think mm -hmm. it is. I don't, it's not even transferred from 8 millimeter. Yeah. And there's no way you yeah, could probably very, see it. Very, yeah, it's very hard to find. So I was trying to, to watch it somewhere, but it wasn't really possible. <laughs> so. And Jane Brackage <laughs> was my thesis film yeah. when I was in yeah, school. I mean, yeah. And um, that only exists in 16 millimeter, but uh -huh. we're writing some grants to get some money to digitize it uh -huh. so it can be available. And, Another film that hasn't been released is, I interviewed Jane Brackage's parents mm -hmm. and um, about her relationship with Stan, mm -hmm. as well as herself, of course. And uh, this exists uh, as video transferred to DVD, uh -huh. but it hasn't been edited to my perfection. I've just mm -hmm. transferred it. Uh -huh, okay. So I wanted to go back and work mm -hmm. on it. Uh -huh. So, uh, well, uh, Speaking about breakage, there was this opinion um, of uh, Maya Deren, who's certainly important also for you. And she said once that uh, his film about his, his baby being born was like too much. She said, well, it, it was too much. So I, I wonder if you agree with this or, or not. This is amazing <laughs> because window water baby moving yeah is exactly why I made Jane Brackage, but mm. I never knew Maya Darren had any commentary about it. Yeah, that's where what, where does she say that? I, I do not really remember. But, oh, uh, but, I want to find she, that but, out. But, but once she said that, that oh. this was like too intimate, that this was, uh, actually f for all of you, this is, this is uh, a film by Stan Brackage in which um, he shows his baby being born. And this is very explicit especially be, because it was made in 59. Yeah. So at that time, uh, it wasn't that common. Uh, not only to show childbirth on film, but also for a father to participate. Yeah, uh, yeah? so yes. it, it wasn't really common at that time. I no, guess. and we can 
thank him for that and for his mm -hmm. other when he went into mm -hmm. the um, morgue mm -hmm. seeing yeah. with one's own eyes yeah, that yeah. isn't quite correct but again he's very concerned about mm -hmm. looking for perce at perception but mm -hmm. I really objected to that film because mm -hmm especially after I met Jane Brackage, because he shows her as an earth goddess. Mm -hmm. You see her in a bathtub with her pregnant belly, mm -hmm. and she's celebrated as if she were on a pedestal, mm -hmm. as if uh, she were extraordinary in terms of mythology. Mm -hmm. And so I decided I wanted to meet her. Mm -hmm. So we invited Stan and Jane to San Francisco State University, where I was a graduate student. Am I talking too fast? No. Okay. And she was so not a goddess. Mm -hmm. She was a very practical person. Mm -hmm. She collected seeds from trees in San Francisco when mm -hmm. we were walking to the school. And she was going to plant them and see if they would grow. <laughs> so I made my thesis film mm -hmm. on her and I went to Colorado high up in the mountains in Rollinsville and I found the most amazing woman mm -hmm. she wrote an alphabet of dog language <laughs> for one thing she could play on her recorder songs to the birds and they would answer her she put out the laundry and then opened her hand without any food in it, and birds landed on it. Mm -hmm. She took a walk through the snow, I was there in January, and her donkey and goats, besides her dogs, followed us oh. on the walk. <laughs> She's an extraordinary yeah. woman who was abused by Stan Brackage. Yeah, in a way. In a way, he yeah. talked all day. Mm -hmm. She had to sit there and listen to him. And also, she had to be in his films. That was also kind <laughs> and of And she didn't get credit. <laughs> Who uh, shot him yeah. when he was cutting yeah. down the tree? It was Jane yeah. Brackett. She yeah. told me. Yeah. And that was, uh, I think, the problem with his second wife, who didn't want to be in, in films. So yeah. then he started making these non-camera uh, films, only, mm -hmm. you know, like painting and scratching and, and stuff. And once yeah. he said that this was because his second wife didn't really want to be on, uh, you know, shown in film, <laughs> especially but giving birth <laughs> or, or having <laughs> sex with him. <laughs> well, I think he was being clever because, you know, he did make Mothlight yeah. before yeah, when he was <laughs> with. And it's a wonderful film. Yeah. He takes a moth and takes their wings, wings yeah. and puts it on celluloid, 16 millimeter film or 35. I saw it and I forget. And it, it was 16, I guess. I think it was 16. 16. And then has it re-photographed in a lab. Mm. So you actually are seeing moths flying. Yeah. It's bringing reality into projection in yeah. a way nobody had done before. This was really excellent idea. Yeah. Okay, going back to your, your cinema. <laughs> oh, yes, that's why we're here, isn't it? <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, we, we just uh, watched Dark Tactics, which is uh, a very famous... Um, uh, very famous film, and uh, well, it was made in in mid 70s, 74. So this was the time when uh, I guess the approach to explicit sex on the screen changed, because on one hand there was your film, which is an art project, and on the other hand we had like uh, Deep Throat, which was uh, a mainstream yeah. porn flick, yeah, yes. like. Yes. A feature film, which was at the same time porn flick. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the sex scene here, they say, is staged. Yeah. So there's no pleasure. Yeah. What What is oh, it? I what, find what, it. What, I what, think what, it's wonderful what, to perform. What, what, I get a what, lot of what pleasure. Is a staged sex scene. Okay. <laughs> In my opinion, uh, when you're shooting sex, it's always staged. It's always a performance. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, I guess you could put a camera on the wall and let it run for all week, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe you would forget it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's pleasure in performance, mm -hmm. and there can be pleasure in a stage set. Mm -hmm. um, but you're very aware of the camera being there, and besides, with the Bolex, mm -hmm. you only get 19 feet, mm -hmm. so it's going to stop, yeah. and you can giggle. Mm -hmm. 
okay. you know, <laughs> and then they wind it again. <laughs> and anyway, I'm in the film uh -huh. and I'm directing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I know it was staged. I know it was pleasurable. Uh -huh. And well, you have to keep your distance in a way also. Not really, time. because <laughs> I had the idea that the best shot in that film is the most intimate. It's the Bolex can run by itself. Mm -hmm. So you wind it and you put it between the two bodies mm -hmm. and you just take your hand away mm -hmm. and it shoots the mm -hmm. scene uh -huh. of the two women pulling their hands up along the body. Mm -hmm. So you have three dimensionality and depth you know, you have sensuality, you have the hand touching. Mm -hmm. And I, if I may interject, my cinema is about connecting touch and sight. Mm -hmm. And so it was perfect to make the screen um, a sexual haptic experience. Mm -hmm. So I hope that the audience feels in their body mm -hmm. what they see mm -hmm. with their eyes. Because my research showed that we we all touch as infants mm -hmm. before we see. Mm -hmm. For two months, your eyes don't focus. Yeah, you actually you actually a, in a, scientific a, a film later about touching. Yes, yeah, sync touch. So, yeah. Yes, so yeah, you know touch, that. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so that's uh, why I, I have 110 images in mm -hmm. those four minutes, and every image has mm -hmm. a sense of touch in mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wonder, because uh, this was kind of a breakthrough, because uh, they say, this was the first uh, art house film in which uh, a lesbian sex scene is shown, an explicit sex scene is shown. But, but obviously, before that, there were many pornographic films with uh, both heterosexual and homosexual uh, scenes in it. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, so this was a, a very important moment because uh, uh, porn films went uh, mainstream on one hand. And on the other hand, uh, there were also people who, who wanted to use pornography in a, in a different way. Yeah, like, uh, not like uh, exploitation, mm -hmm. but uh, in a more, so to say, progressive way. So my question is, do you believe that it's possible to use pornography uh, in, uh, in a decent way, in, in a proper way, uh, and make some kind of value out of it? Do you mean when we say what is proper way and what is a pleasure? You mean for pleasure, for sexual arousement? Can you? Is that uh, what you're asking me? Uh, actually, uh, the critique of pornography is always that it's exploitation of mostly uh, female bodies and female sexuality mm -hmm. for male pleasure, and mm -hmm. this is how it works mm -hmm. usually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but on, on the other hand, there were well women feminists who, who, who wanted to redefine pornography. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, uh, because, well, I'm asking this question because your, your film is certainly not a proper pornography. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but no. on, the, on the other hand, it, it is as explicit as some of, well, let's say, soft goal pornography films. Yeah? Yes. So the borderline is, is really, you know, kind of obscure. Well, this is a fun question that we could probably talk about for hours, but <laughs> one of I have no objection to people being stimulated in whatever way they want to, visually or texturally um, or with their imagination um, um, or with the real thing. But <laughs> I think that um, I was very concerned that my work not be voyeured Mm -hmm. So when you come to some other films like Nitrate Kisses, mm -hmm. when you have four different couples making love throughout the feature mm -hmm. documentary, I make sure that I interrupt. Mm -hmm. And throughout that film, there's the rupture, not only to show the loss of gay history, mm -hmm. which was my intention, mm -hmm. but also to say this isn't made, this film is not made for sexual pleasure and stimulation, although it's okay with me if mm -hmm. you are, mm -hmm. but um, to talk about the collapse and the loss of sexual expression in queer film history, and also about um, the r oppression you know, I want to say the censorship that we queers have or had mm -hmm. in 1993 when I made that film. 
we had our own sense. So the f whole film is about censorship. But then if you looked at your own community, what do film theoreticians, what are they censoring? So I looked at the queer community. What are we censoring? We're censoring old woman. Mm -hmm. We never see them on the screen. Mm -hmm. We're censoring black and white couples. We're censoring young women who shave their heads and tattoo their bodies. We're, we're censoring sadomasochistic sex practices. Um, this was at the time of the sex wars in the feminist community. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to say, hey, we're not holier than thou. <laughs> yeah. But we have our own forms mm -hmm. of censorship. Mm -hmm. So another question uh, about, uh, well, your film called Menses. Uh, which is also 74. Mm -hmm. It was on the screen <laughs> for a minute. <laughs> uh, so uh, I really enjoyed this one because it's so affirmative. So uh, in many uh, films or feminist performances, the problem of menstruation was uh, shown as kind of a curse. I, I don't really know much about it because <laughs> I never menstruated. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, I, I, I wish I could. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, you know, you know. A lot of times when I'm teaching, I have young men and Caucasian men, let's say, in my class. Uh -huh. I haven't seen a film of a wet dream yet. Okay. Do you know? I mean, yeah. there are it's different expressions yeah. that our gendered bodies uh -huh. have, and uh -huh. um, yeah. So I'm. I'm happy to tell you about menstruation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this was very right. unique because it's so it's so fun. It's affirmative. So, so the girls who are buying like uh, you know the massive amounts of uh, tampaxes and yes. stuff. Uh, th this is this is kind of a performance, but on the other hand, it's it's very affirmative. It's not like uh, the other things that I've had seen about the subject. So. Well, you know, I made that film because I had seen the Disney, Walt Disney films. Uh -huh. And when we were children, the girls were separated from the boys and only the girls went to see about menstruation. Oh, okay. And it was all about flowers. <laughs> it wasn't at all about the experience of dripping blood between your legs, right? So, but there are some there's some serious notes in that film. For instance, we researched menstruation in history. And I guess it's not in the film, but to make that film, I researched. And I had a slumber party, and I shared my research then with the young women who were in the film. And one of them was from the Greek, Pliny, mm -hmm. who said that if a woman is menstruating and she touches a pregnant mare pregnant horse mm -hmm. her milk will go sour oh, okay. and you yeah, know yeah. historically women have been banned in mm -hmm. different cultures you mm -hmm. go to that house when you're menstruating outside the village outside the village mm -hmm. so there's that is the reason and the impetus plus my own personal history with my mother telling me mm -hmm. about menstruation which she didn't <laughs> wow. that made me make that film yeah yeah i think it still happens in poland very often I guess. Sadly. I think that's why I'm in Poland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we can talk mission. about menstruation <laughs> and other things. So there, there's also a, another uh, uh, film made in the 70s uh, called Super Dyke, which is also fun with girls uh, attacking institutions and taking over. Uh, so uh, when I was watching this, uh, I, I had this uh, question if. Uh, uh, if uh, experimental cinema or avant-garde cinema uh, is the best tool to be an activist. Because once uh, a German filmmaker who, who also uh, made experimental films in the 70s, uh, I mean, Rainer Werner Fassbinder, uh, he, has, he had this problem that he wanted to make uh, radical cinema but then he realized that the audience he wanted to, ad to address yeah. really wanted to, to watch melodramas and uh, American Hollywood film. Yeah. So his avant-garde and experimental cinema yeah. was actually going nowhere yeah. because those people he wanted to, to reach mm -hmm. 
they wanted to, you know, to to have more contact with mainstream culture. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what is your opinion, because certainly you make uh, experimental cinema, which is not for everybody. No. Yeah? But on the other hand, certainly it's an activist cinema. So you wanted to, in a way, change the world with it. Yeah, it's a big word, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm functioning as a visual artist, and that I can only make what I can make and what I want to make. And if I'm self-funding my films, which I was for many years, the 70s, I think for 15 years at least, I made the films out of my own pocket, then I have to be giving myself pleasure. I have to be doing what I want for the reasons that I have, and they don't necessarily have to do with activism. But you know one thing, Foss, and I, my audience is the same as Fossbender's. They want a narrative. They want a lesbian happy ending. Or, you know, um, this was in the 70s and the 80s. The queer audience wasn't used to experimental film any more than the straight audience. So I can't say that my films were, you know, uh, well attended always until you know, sometimes they were when when my name became known, but ma mainly, mainly if there was a celebration and we could have a dance afterwards, okay. because there was so all... So the times were different, yeah? The times were different, but the thing is, Fossbinder isn't alive today, and I am. Oh, yeah. So I'm wondering about his change of direction. Do you see what I mean? If um, we don't yeah. do what really yeah. pleases yeah, yeah. us, maybe we get depressed and... Mm -hmm choose an end before yeah, actually I think his end. problem was like different it was more like drugs and alcohol and this was what killed him mm -hmm. I guess but then we can ask what why the drugs and alcohol oh yeah <laughs> I mean you know <laughs> that's always this know. question okay so um, uh, there's also another thing that I want to ask about uh, film uh, women I love because um, in this film you are using a slightly different imagery because in the early films you were uh, explicit. So it was maybe, I think at that time, it could, could have been quite shocking to some people to see like uh, explicit sex scene. And then uh, in uh, Women I Love, you use uh, Georgia O'Keeffe style imagery like fruits and vegetables oh, yeah. evoking mm -hmm. uh, well, sexual images, yeah? Mm -hmm. So quite recently, um, there was this exhibition, I, I think it's still on, in Tate Modern, uh, I mean, Georgia O'Keeffe oh, yeah. exhibition. Yeah. And it was, uh, uh, I, I wonder if you know that there was a, a small scandal because yeah. this exhibition was sort of s censored by the curator who decided not to show too many, you know, those explicit, vagina uh, pictures, yeah. So there are only like six or seven of them uh, in the entire exhibition, and all the rest are, you know, different pictures. So, so they said that she was like too shy to show those images, and we have 21st century, and this is not like, you know, pornographic images of <laughs> vaginas. Yeah. These are flowers evoking vaginas. So. And Georgia O'Keeffe said yeah. that they were not sexual. To yeah. her, I mean, I don't agree with her, yeah. but she said she was painting flowers, right? Yeah. And um, mountains with curves in them and valleys. Uh huh. So uh, I, I, I'm asking about your preference. So, so uh, because you you started with explicit images and then you started to exploit more uh, well evocative and uh, metaphorical. Yeah. metaphorical and poetic images to show sexuality. Mm -hmm. So, so why is it so? It just happens. Well, so. you know, you could say that um, the film Women I Love was 1976, just mm -hmm. two years after Dictactics. Mm -hmm. And then in 93, I'm showing explicit sexuality again. Mm -hmm. So, and in History Lessons in 2000, I'm showing pornography. Mm -hmm. Pornography of lesbians made by men. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think there's like some adverse 
reaction that I was having to sexual expression, I was interested in animation. <laughs> and also, these were six or so of my lovers, six or seven lovers that I had no intention really of making a film. When I started, I just was shooting our relationship. And then it seemed to me on one rainy day, when there was nothing to do but make a film, that the each woman could represent a different fruit or vegetable. Mm -hmm. And I only had that material that I had shot to work with. And so that became Women I Love. Uh, this, this was also interesting, what you said about, uh, well, um, lesbian pornography shot by men. Yes. So I wonder if it, why is it so like uh, uh, popular among men to watch lesbian pornography? Well, I have to ask you that. Uh, <laughs> but let um, me talk about history okay. lesson, if I may. <laughs> yeah. So there were three. Um, there are three feature um, documentaries, essay documentaries, films about ideas rather than talking heads about somebody or other. They're all about queer history. So after Nitrate Kisses, I made a post postmodern autobiography called Tender Fictions, mm -hmm. and that was followed by the film History Lessons. Because if you look for lesbian cinema, there wasn't any. Mm -hmm. And I felt like we needed to have a foundation. We need to build our culture. So I would take what was already there, which was medical films made about lesbian, educational films. Oh, don't let your daughter get too close to her schoolmate. <laughs> Pornography made by men. Going back to 1920, I found one. Mm -hmm. um, and make a comedy out of those mm -hmm. so that that could be our history. Mm -hmm. That we can, and that's very queer, mm -hmm. to take something that already exists, turn it around, mm -hmm. make it malleable and flexible, mm -hmm. and reclaim it. Mm -hmm. That's making cinema space queer space. And I mean, I didn't have that language for it when I made it, but I knew that I wanted to uh, make a foundation of what was there. And I had to do it through being funny. Mm -hmm. That was always a uh, fascinating, fascinating question for, to me, because a uh, uh, heterosexual man would never go and watch uh, uh, a homosexual pornography with males, with, with men. But uh, on the other hand, uh, many of them, those heterosexual men, would enjoy lesbian scenes in pornography. Because if they watched male homosexual sexuality, that might implicate them. Mm -hmm. But a woman, soft and gentle and over there, and a lesbian over there, that maybe they could convince to have sex with them, mm -hmm. isn't threatening. Yeah. It does not threaten their masculine construction. And that's what we're talking about, really, is the way you and I were brought up by our mm -hmm. parents and our school mm -hmm. and our educational system. You know, I mean, you and I could have exactly the same feelings if we were brought up in a non-sexist environment. Mm -hmm. And I think it's possible. And I think young people today are experiencing that. Mm -hmm. So it's really, I mean, it's not about me changing the world. It's about the world is changing. <laughs> well, anyway, I think... Your, your visit is really important because uh, back in the 70s and later, uh, you were openly speaking about uh, female sexual pleasure, which is uh, lots of fun, yeah? Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. I mean, there's, you know, I, don't, uh, I think we should but, go on to another subject. <laughs> this is turning but, into a porn panel. <laughs> okay. But uh, my question is that well, we actually, at the moment, so your visit is really important, I guess, because uh, you probably know that last year uh, we elected a new government, uh, which is, uh, I think, quite a disaster. So, uh, well, I'm an academic, yeah? So uh, the minister of, uh, well, higher education uh, he once said that uh, we, we have to do something with these gender studies because this is uh, not a real, you know, academic subject. It's just a nonsense. 
So we have to, and this is what, what he really said, the minister. Yeah? So quite recently, just a few days ago, we had a huge fight uh, over abortion, which is, uh, you probably know that Polish law is quite restrictive at the moment. And they wanted, I mean, the new government, that, then it became complicated, but there was, uh, there was um, a fight in Polish parliament over the uh, rights to abortion. So they wanted to ban it completely. So even if the child is the effect of rape, or the child is dead, or the child is not able to live, or has severe, you know, uh, medical issues, then you cannot abort. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if, uh, because uh, I think one uh, in one of your interviews somewhere in the internet, you said that, uh, well, we still have to fight for feminist issues. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we win, then feminism is not necessary. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I wonder yeah. Yeah. how would you comment on this situation in Poland? Mm -hmm. This yeah. is the middle of Europe. Mm -hmm. This is not like... Uh, so well, it's shocking um, on the one hand of what the government was prescribing in the legislature and on the ha other hand, the activism of the public mm -hmm. changing because 24,000, as I read, are in the streets, men and women. Men can be feminists too. Yeah. You know, of course. <laughs> Hello. <good. laughs> and you are. Um, are there uh, objecting? And this would have gone on and on and on. I know more demonstrations were planned because some of my friend, my Polish friends are mm -hmm. directly involved in that. And to see the power of the people immediately changed the minds of mostly men in the legislature to reconsider, I think is very successful. Well, I think it's successful, but on the other hand, um, I also have some doubts about it. Tell me. So I, I wonder if it's not like uh, that they really didn't want to change the law in the first place, oh. but they played it. Played it because of the president? No, no, they just played it because uh, they just wanted to make people come to the streets and protest yeah. and then say, well, we are listening to the people. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they're that smart. Uh, <laughs> they are not too smart. <laughs> I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm not sure if they, well, if, if they are listening, because we, <laughs> so <laughs> if they are listening, then they, they are going to close this place and you are going to lose your job. Okay? And if we were... <laughs> I'm just visiting, yeah, so I've got another job. <laughs> so so if you don't don't want to lose your job, just just tell me to go, okay? <laughs> so, yeah, I, yeah, I I'm also optimistic and I also uh I was really happy with those protests, but on the other hand, uh I'm not sure if it wasn't really played. Well, that really surprises and shocks me, and it's the first time I've heard that, so I don't know what to say except to listen to you and be open to maybe that's possible. Mm -hmm. But I had the feeling that if the legislature did not, legislators did not change, and they really haven't, as I understand, really fixed the law yet, it's too soon to see, mm -hmm. that it could become a global imperative mm -hmm. that people from all over Europe and Australia, the Southeast Asia, the US and the South America would be coming to Poland to protest. I had this vision. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be, I think yeah, it will happen if, if things aren't changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's hope so. Uh, well, I, I think the, the, the people who protested were really honest, yeah, and this was uh, really good. But on the other hand, uh, the government, they knew the statistics. And actually, uh, over 60% of Polish society is not really, over 70, I'm sorry, is not really willing to change the abortion law. Yeah. yeah. So they yeah. support uh, status quo, or they, mm -hmm. some of them are, mm -hmm. you know, more progressive. So, so they, they want abortion on demand. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think the government knows the statistics. Mm -hmm. So they know if 
that if they introduce the law, mm -hmm. then it means, you know, problems for them, for them. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, <laughs> so another 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 subject is related to uh, to the film that I really like. It's called Pools. It's um, it, it's different because. Uh, it doesn't, uh, on the surface, it, do, it doesn't have uh, a feminist subject, it doesn't have, like, uh, there's no... But underneath, there is something, because actually it's a, it's a, it's a film about uh, a female uh, architect yeah, who designed this uh, strange palace for Citizen Kane. Yeah? <laughs> so, uh, so I wonder, because in this film, and also in some other of your films, you use uh, manipulation of the uh, uh, footage, you know, of the stock, of the film stock. Mm -hmm. So so you use drawing, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, maybe a bit Stan Brackett style, mm -hmm. you also use this technique. Mm -hmm. So so what, what made you so, so interested uh, in uh, the, uh, the very substance of, of uh, film stock? Well, um, I began to identify as an artist when I was 27. And when I was 30, I was taking a painting class. I thought I'd be a painter. Uh -huh. And um, my teacher came up to me and he said, you're more interested in movement than you are in putting the paint on the canvas. Our subject was a woman on a motorcycle. She'd come right into the studio and I had painted her with four arms and four legs. I'd never saw Duchamp. You mm -hmm. know, I didn't know that much about art at that time. Maybe I still don't, but in any case, that's what he told me. And he brought in some clear film without any image on it and a projector that was open, not encased. And he told me I could paint on the film. So I started painting on the film mm -hmm and projecting that onto the canvas. And then I started painting with black light, fluorescent film, mm -hmm. yeah. and showing black light and then turning it on, turning it off, so I had more movement. Mm -hmm. And I think he's right. I, I mean, I used to paint all the way around the room. I'd stretch my paper, not canvas, and I would work, 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 mm -hmm. you know, because he was a post-abstract expressionist, so you're supposed to find your gesture, you're supposed to find your language. This was the, you know, what so, I heard. So do you feel like attached to this tradition of uh, abs abstract? I love abstraction. Um, uh, I don't feel Stan attached Rackage to it. Was, in a way, he was too. Yeah. Yeah, in yep. miniature. Yeah, because yep. he was like uh, Jackson Pollock, but in a yeah, like a huge yeah. Scale, right? With huge canvases, yeah. And uh, breakage was just uh, painting his on tiny the frame. Yeah. But then, if you go to Snow Job, the media hysteria of AIDS in mm -hmm. 1988, well, I think. Mm -hmm. No, earlier than that, 1985 or six. I'm talking about media mm -hmm. and how media has distorted um, the truth. For instance, there are bumper stickers in the United States that say, um, you know eat like a Republican and you won't get AIDS. <laughs> really crazy things, you know, like um, don't let your hairdresser sneeze on you. You know, full of stereotypes. And so I'm, you know, I turned then in 85 to um, a critical cinema, a cinema that was led not by my body, but by my mind, which is part of my body but not neglecting it and finding my pleasure in intellectual research and critique. So I think when you're talking to a cineast who's worked for 40 years, like Picasso, there are stages in the work. And uh, I think that's the way my work should be addressed. Okay. So the next question is related to another film that was shown here yesterday called Sanctus. And there was also this documentary about X-ray. Uh, it's not a proper documentary; it's a documentary essay. So. But um, so, so you discovered the, this uh, can of film in Rochester. Yes. There's this excellent archive, yes. uh, the, the George Eastman House, 
so 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 this was really fascinating. So so I wanted to ask about this. Uh, what what was so interesting in in, in those X-ray films for you? Because you were before you were showing the the surface of the body, and then you, you go deeper. Uh, and then uh, there's also another approach because this is, to some extent, I it's a found footage film. Yes. So in a way, you manipulate it, you, you change it yes. uh, somehow. So it, it was yeah. probably a new experience. So uh, th there's this filmmaker, American filmmaker, uh, whose name is Bill Morrison. Oh, yeah. I know Bill. Uh, so I, I think there's something like oh, a yeah, relationship oh, yeah. between Very your much. films and these uh, and other, uh, Dawson City, his new one. He just premiered yeah. it in Venice. Yeah, yeah, I, know. I haven't yeah. seen it yet. I just saw it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's beautiful. So, so, so again, we are going back to to the film stock, to the mm -hmm. very substance, to mm -hmm. something that is really material. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's also kind kind of a evolution because in your earlier films you were just using cinema as kind of a tool to show mm -hmm. reality, and now you mm -hmm. try to eliminate explore it and understand something that is very substantial. Yes, so. the fact that it's a chemically based and that it can burn, that it you can drop acid on it, it can make the most beautiful circles. Mm -hmm. You can throw salt on it. We're in the land of salt here, <laughs> which is a crystal formation, you know, which creates facets of light then. Uh -huh. um, there's many, uh, the manipulation, I've taken film, I put it through a sewing machine and then re-photographed it in the film Endangered, where I'm talking about the life on the Galapagos Islands being endangered and really all of us. Um, because it is a material form. That's the reason, you know, and because approaching it as a painter originally um, I, I want to put my hands on it and, and move it around, but now it's mm -hmm. digital. Okay. So, 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 <laughs> so the next, <laughs> ne ne next film is uh, uh, one of my favorites, M maybe my favorite, uh, I mean, Nitrate Kisses from the early 90s. So there is some kind of relationship between the previous the Sanctus film and this one. So in this film, you, you, you wanted to combine like two subjects. One of them is, uh, well, films that are in a way going somewhere, passing away, yeah. yeah? And also the memory of, uh, uh, well, lesbian experience and mm -hmm. s sensuality. So mm -hmm. what is the link really? Because the, the, this film in a way operates in two levels, yeah? It's like uh, about uh, something that we lose in in terms of uh, cinema, its material, um, well, basis, and also in terms of memory of uh, lesbian history. You know, it's lesbian and gay male history. Yeah. There's quite yeah, a bit of gay male uh, sexuality and representation mm -hmm. and AIDS march in uh, Paris mm -hmm. and so on. But. Um, I was really influenced by Roland Barthes' study of history mm -hmm. and Walter Benjamin's. Mm -hmm. And when Walter Benjamin says that you can understand a culture by a fragment, mm -hmm. this is what made me think that the fragments of queer history can be brought together and made into a whole. Mm -hmm. And that we don't need to have the entire bottle here to understand it, it could be broken and we have one piece of glass. If we have one piece of glass, we can understand that this culture was based on heat, perhaps coal, you know, um, uh, and we can make, we can surmise a lot about the culture from the fragment. So this was my intention with a nitrate kisses besides the interrupting the historic fragments with the sexual, uh, contemporary, mm -hmm. um, censored within our community fragments mm -hmm. that I've already spoken about. Mm -hmm. So the next question is related to, I think, a very personal film. I mean, the film in, in which you mm, portray 
your experience with cancer. Yeah? So the, the, the film is personal. So I'm going to start with some kind of a personal story also. So um, I don't have that experience yet. Yeah? But good. <laughs> but actually, um, I'm not sure about the word because technically she's my wife, but I, I really don't like the word. Um, yeah. I don't either. Yeah, I say spouse. Uh, okay. I'm married, and yeah, I say spouse. Yeah, so I, so I, I say the love of my life. Love yeah. is better. Yeah, yeah love of my life. Yeah. Yeah. So the love of my life, she, she, well, <laughs> it was like a few years ago, but but she, she she had cancer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you you had like nine chemo's. Yeah. She, in that in that film. Mm -hmm. In that film. So mm -hmm. she also had nine. Yeah. Oh. So it's like. Mm -hmm something <laughs> mm -hmm. but there was this story that once um, when she was a bit you know better mm -hmm. she wanted to go shopping and we have a small market mm -hmm. which is a, a splendid place you have to ask uh, Ad Adrian to uh, to to guide you uh, because there are those people who come from the mountains with uh, oh. you know local products like yeah. cheese and stuff mm -hmm. so it's very good uh, so uh, she wanted to go uh, shopping, and uh, uh, it was uh, probably after I don't know the fifth or sixth chemo, so she she was hairless. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So uh, she had a wig, mm -hmm. but then uh, she forgot to wear it, mm -hmm. and then uh, she was approached by a woman who said, "This is unacceptable. Oh. Mm -hmm. You cannot go out like this. This is like going naked in public." Uh, wow. you know, place. So this wasn't really intentional. Yeah? She was just, yeah, right. just a bit absent-minded. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I wonder, I started with this story because uh, you were speaking about um, very intimate uh, issues yeah? mm -hmm. in your films. And this is very intimate because this was your fight, yeah? your fight for your life. Uh, so uh, I wonder if you if you wanted to if, if this was the reason to make this film mm -hmm. uh, to in a way to break the taboo mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. or maybe it was more personal mm -hmm. so was it made for you mm -hmm. rather than for the audience? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think all my work going back to Dark Tactics and even before that there was some films called The Gay Day mm -hmm. is to make what isn't seen visible. To, you know, people use that phrase today, but they didn't use to it. To make the invisible visible. I had never seen a film or read a book about going through cancer treatments, through chemotherapy, that kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. That's why I made the film. Mm -hmm. And also because people don't know about ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. which is the kind of cancer that I have. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to share because... Ovarian cancer is misdiagnosed mm -hmm. many, many times. And if you knew what the symptoms were, you would be able to survive it if you, were, if you could catch it in the first few stages oh. of it. And so at the end of the film, I write, a, I'm, the text is on the film, mm -hmm. bloating, you know, frequent urination, back pain, um, and other, you know, symptoms. But many doctors, you go to them and they say, oh, you have gastrointestinal issues. They don't go and then take a scan where then they could see, mm. ah, there's a tumor growing on the ovary. Mm. Let's get it out mm. and do a complete hysterectomy, which is required if you're going to you know, survive. Mm. So these things that I learned, because my cancer, I had frequent urination. But I was in Thailand, and I was hiking the temples. And I thought, oh, and I'm drinking a lot of water. Mm -hmm. This was the reason. Yeah. If I had known that when I came back mm -hmm. and gone to the doctor, maybe I would have caught it earlier. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But that's so it wasn't the like reason. For, for you to cope with it, it was rather for the other people. For I never thought I'd make a film on that. I mean, um, I didn't shoot it while I was going through it. My mm. friend shot all the footage of me with bald mm. and walking nude in the forest. And my 
spouse, lover shot me in the waiting room and getting the chemo dripped. And then the last day I decided to take the camera myself because the light was so beautiful coming through the, chem the chemistry that was hanging there in the bags. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was um, how I got the footage. So it was only, you know, maybe a year or two, a year and a half later that I decided to make the film because mm -hmm. people said to me right away, oh, you're going to make a film of this, aren't you? Oh, no, so no, I'd never <laughs> show something so awful as going through chemotherapy. Um, so that's the reason yeah, behind this it. Was, this was probably a new experience because you used someone else's footage uh, and actually edited this, yeah, adding something for, for yeah. from you. Part, so partly, but you know, if you go back even to Dyke Tactics, mm -hmm. somebody else shot that film. Yeah. You know, I'm saying, come on over. Mm -hmm. And I said, pet us as mm -hmm. if you're stroking us. Mm -hmm. Pretend, you know, mm -hmm. that you're being sensual with us, with the camera. Mm -hmm. So she would move it the way I would want. Mm -hmm. But I didn't shoot it. So, yeah. you know, I mean, there's, but I you, think that's gone on you, for a long time. You didn't time. shoot it, but, but you directed. I directed, yeah. 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 And in this case, I didn't direct. Because yep. this was somebody else mm. just observed. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, p probably, um, well, I, I should <laughs> give you a chance to ask your questions, but I have just one more uh, about uh, the other film that I really uh, enjoyed a lot. Uh, this was the film about Maya Deren. Uh, so, uh, you said that, uh, well, in a way, she started everything uh, in avant-garde cinema, although, of course, there were people making avant-garde films earlier before she made meshes of the, of the afternoon, but but uh, I, I would like you to to uh, I would like to ask you to comment on your relationship with Maya Darren. Uh, to is is she mm -hmm. still like important oh, for you? I, she's important to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm taking film history. There are a hundred of us in the audience at San Francisco State University um, before they let me in the master's program because my first master's degree was in English literature. My BA was in psychology. So I was just beginning film studies. I hadn't heard of Truffaut, et cetera. You know, naive, 30-year-old naive. Mm -hmm. Every film for the whole semester was made by a man. I couldn't believe it. This class was almost over, and we hadn't seen a woman director. Suddenly, on the screen, came this 15-minute black and white film I knew it was by a woman mm -hmm. because she was, the images were entirely different from what a male director would shoot mm -hmm. and because she was working from the inside out. She was showing her emotions through um, her directing. Even if she was in the film, she was directing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, aha, I'm sure I should make cinema now. Because if they don't show anybody for the entire year, except for this one short film, there is a blank screen in terms of women's cinema, and in terms of lesbian cinema, there's absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. So that was important. Then when I studied her, she was more than a filmmaker. Yeah, she did what we're doing. Yeah. She went out in the world to universities. She set up lectures and screenings. Then, she is a theorist. She wrote theory. Yeah. And you can get that and read it today. It's just as invalid and relevant as it was when she wrote it. And she set up a distribution system mm -hmm. so that people could rent the films, universities, uh, cinema clubs. And this was really remarkable. Mm -hmm. She made, she lectured, she distributed. You know, she was a powerhouse of a woman. I never, of course, met her. She died before I even began to think about film. Um, and then if you read her writings, they continue to inspire and, and look at her work. It's um, incredible what she's left us. Yeah, I, I think she was very powerful because technically the film was directed not only by her, but also by Sasha Hamid. Right. Who is her husband at, at that time? Yeah, so it's a mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a, a she's a co yeah, it's a collaboration. Mm -hmm. But whenever I speak uh, about this with my students, they always say it's Maya Darren's 
film, yeah. they never mentioned Hamid. Yes. Although <laughs> he was he was there and yeah, he was he was shot. It. He, yeah, he shot it. Yeah. So it's uh, I think it, it it shows her, you know, power, uh, in a way. So for me, she's an re she's really icon of uh, avant-garde cinema. So yeah. so but whenever I teach courses on avant-garde film, I always. Uh, uh, maybe not start, but but I always use meshes of the afternoon as an example of yeah. how yeah. how how you you make it. <laughs> and if you but if you look at her other work, it's not as strong as her first work. Mm -hmm. And I think that is Sasha Hamid's uh, contribution because mm -hmm. he was schooled in cinema, mm -hmm. Czechoslovakia, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And he had, she'd never shot with a camera yeah. before. He, he, he used to be a photographer. So he was, so yeah. He, he was quite experienced. He was very stuff. experienced. And I think that the conception, I mm -hmm. think, you know, one only conjectures today. Mm -hmm. But I think she would talk about her ideas and what she wanted, and he would have an idea of how it could be filmed. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think she learned from that, but then they divorced. Mm -hmm so that she worked with a, actually a female mm -hmm. cinematographer in her other films. Mm -hmm. But they're a little bit stagey. They're not as fluid mm -hmm. as meshes. Yeah. So yeah. Um, she lost more than a husband mm -hmm. when yeah. she divorced. Okay. Okay. Yeah. OK, so um, thank you very much for, oh, for, this, was for fun. this conversation. <laughs> it was really uh, interesting for me. So I hope. Uh, uh, the audience uh, also has uh, questions. Polish people are usually quite shy. Oh no, this these <laughs> these fellows have they're told not, me they, they came not, with questions because they, they were here last night. Yeah, they, they are not Polish. But <laughs> are you Polish? Ah, we're changing okay. Poland. If we're out in the street, we're also talking in the auditorium. <laughs> okay, so so sure. well, if you have any questions, uh, should we give them a the mic uh, so it can be recorded? Uh, yeah, then you're in the. Um, yeah, this, um, can you hear me? Is that right? Yes. Um, right, Why so, don't you say your name so and where uh, you're from? So we yeah, um, so my name is Phil. And um, yeah, I'm living here in Krakow. And what I just want to ask you is, was like, um, you know, yesterday, um, that was the first time for me to uh, seeing a movie. And uh, the first um, that I that I please sorry. Um, I think you should be on camera. Should I be? <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. It's okay. It's alright. <laughs> I hear you. I, I I can I can go in front of you if you like. Yeah. Um, should I? Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> You're gonna um, be famous. <laughs> uh, um. So yeah. Um. The the first um we saw. Um. It's um, for me, and I think for uh, most of the people over here, it was like, you know, um, kind of the first impression that we got on the movies and something that will affect um, the, the other uh, work that will come on uh, in, the, in the eyes of the uh, audience. Um, so I just want to ask, what was the first, um, because it was like a like breakthrough, it was like, you know, so what was the first um, thoughts you got, the first, um, what, what came up in your head to make this movie, like, what, you know, what was the thing that makes you, yeah, I'm gonna make the movie that looks like this, like this, and, and you know, at all, it, right now it's like describing the, your work right now. So, so what, was, what was your idea in the first? Thank you, Philippe, for that no question. I'm gonna stand up to answer it because okay. Okay. Um, it's, um, it's, it's about the body. So I was heterosexual for nine years before I came out with a woman my whole worldview changed because when I touched her body, it was like touching my own. It reinforced my sense of touch. So this was an incredible change for me. And that's why Dyke Tactics is all about touching. And there are 110 images in four minutes. Every single image has a sense of touch in it. And it it was the impetus for making the film. My life was changed by making love with a woman, so therefore, I was studying cinema, I should put it on film. That was the pure impetus for making Dyke Tactics. So you said that was, um, uh, the, the scene was staged, but it was still like really personal for you. 
Yes, because I couldn't ask somebody else to be in the film if I wouldn't be in the film. All right. So I was, it was me and my lover of the time who said yes, she right. would. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for that question. Thank you. I'm thinking about your two films, my favorite and I think most personal. I'm thinking about Double Strength, this very intimate romantic movie, and about the horse is not a metaphor. And I was here tonight, I was watching more you than films because I knew them. Ariel, Ariel, and I was thinking yesterday, wasn't that difficult for you to watch that films, that really personal uh, movies from your life? You know, it it isn't difficult anymore. I see it as that woman on the screen. Um, and besides that, I'm a performer. That's why I'm standing up here now. And I'm also preparing a performance on my cancer. If you have ovarian cancer, you're never cancer free. So I am preparing a, a new piece having to do with x-rays and my body, and I'm going to do it in front of people. So I don't know what can be more personal than that. And my head will be shaved. Rather than wearing a wig, I will take oh, this away. A CAT scan will be projected on my head. Um, images are projected on my body. My face is projected on a balloon. And the air goes out of the balloon. So it's going to be um, an emotional piece for the audience and for me. So are, are, you, are you going to come to Poland to this performance too? If I'm invited, I will come. You are. I bring my balloons. <laughs> And we will blow them up together. <laughs> All right. Daję mikrofon pani Ani, przepraszam. My name is Anna, and I would like to ask about your first movies and uh, about the first audience. Who was it? Was it a lesbian community or art community? What was the distribution of these films? Thank you for that question. Um, the first audience was really the lesbian community. The very first films I made were Super 8, and I made them, and 8 millimeter when I was married. So they were heterosexual. heterosexual. They were also nude. Um, and uh, you, we were influenced by the hippie movement at that time. And I showed them to a group of lesbians, and half of them left, most of them left, because there were men in my pictures, <laughs> nude men. <laughs> And uh, I was shocked. I didn't know why. And these two women who had two children, one a girl and one a boy, stayed. And they told me that, you know, this early lesbian movement, some women were separatists. And they didn't want to have anything to do with men, but because they had boy children or a boy child, they were more tolerant. So, I mean, you know, things have changed a lot, but that's um, the early... Films were shown in coffee houses, one time in a bar, which I would never do again because it was not the place to show an art film. Um, I found out too late. And it was only after I'd made about 10, 12 films that I got a phone call from a cinematheque in Los Angeles. I was living in San Francisco, inviting me to come with my films. Um, and that was the avant-garde experimental film community inviting me. And then I saw that my work was larger than a particular group of people. So, and I was happy because I felt ghettoized. You're not in the way you use that word here in Poland. But I felt a restricted audience because I didn't make it just for lesbians. But So, so you don't believe in ghettos. You, you believe that like uh, a gay film should be shown. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I had this <laughs> very funny experience once because uh, it was like, I, I think more than 15 years ago and I had a course at the university about gay cinema. Uh, and at that time it was quite a new subject. So, so it 
probably I, I don't know it was maybe the first course on gay cinema uh, in our university, which is quite traditional, I guess. <laughs> In what university is that? It's a Jagiellonian university. It's, it's actually um, 650 years old. So it's the second oldest university in Europe. Quite, you know, traditional in some way. So it was quite funny because after the course, there was a boy uh, who was gay, and he came up and, and, and said, well, that's really excellent what you did because we have to stick together. We have to be, like, strong. And I was, um, this was quite um, difficult for me because I'm not gay. Mm -hmm. And he thought I was. Mm -hmm. But I had this problem, what to say? Mm -hmm. Well, because, you know, if I, if I say, I'm sorry, I'm not gay, mm -hmm. maybe he'd, he'd be disappointed. Mm -hmm. But, I, 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 well, I was thinking about this, that this is, sometimes it's like building ghettos, yeah? But uh, you know, today it's really wonderful because ever since the internet came up, I was doing making a lesbian archive on the internet way back in 95. And I said, anybody can be a lesbian. Because mm -hmm. yeah. you could go on the internet and put in your tattoo mm -hmm. and say it's a lesbian tattoo. I was asking for scannings of mm -hmm. clothing and the body as contributions and stories too. And today it's so wonderful we have the word queer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you can be a straight man and be mm -hmm. queer if you really work at it. <laughs> we might let you. <laughs> so, um, and it's such an embracing, fluid term that you, but I understand your dilemma at that time. That would be difficult. But on the other hand, that student needs reality. Yeah. You could uh, have in said, a way, I'm excused by, because I'm, I, I am really queer. I'm going to tell you, tell you later. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> well, I thought so. <laughs> 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 oh, this is a lot of fun. So I'm just wondering, Natalie, what you're thinking, Natalia. Um, why are you wondering what I'm thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I'm because surprised. I, I wonder sometimes what the audience who's listening, not just you, but mm -hmm. maybe one of you, mm -hmm. you know, you must be having some thoughts mm -hmm. so I'm curious what, the, what it might be. Well, first of all, I just found out about this meeting two uh, hours ago, so I, there hasn't been much time to prepare, uh, but all the conversation has been very inspirational. Uh, you're a very inspirational woman, and, and thanks to the professor, the, uh, the conversation has been uh, interesting. Uh, so everything's ahead of me. <laughs> I just, I'm not prepared. Uh, I haven't got any um, questions prepared, uh, but I would like to know um, do you what what do you do besides um your your movie career do you do you teach or do thank you so there was a question <laughs> <laughs> um i have been teaching at the european graduate school in switzerland it's uh, to get your masters and your phd and it's only 3 weeks a year and you study, you go to many, many seminars, three a day for three hours each. I'm only there for three days. I do nine seminars <laughs> and a lecture at night. <laughs> it's a very easy, well, you have to prepare, but. Um, and then I'm free, but the students also go home and write their thesis for the next year or two years, and they have advice and advisory. It's not a production school, it's theory, but heavily based in philosophy. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to speak Swiss version of German. <laughs> if the school is taught in English. But what else do I do with my time? I make new work. <laughs> you know, once you have the joy of creativity, it's really hard to stop. I mean, I, t I tell myself, because I have cancer, stop working so hard. Take another vacation. So here in Poland, I take my vacation before our talk, you know, and I I say, okay, next year I won't work so hard. <laughs> but right now I'm working really hard on this performance. But I get pleasure from it. It's so exciting to be creative and to make something happen. You have an idea and then you make it happen. Wow, that's a thrill. 
That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? There. So. <laughs> Don't be shy. Yeah, really? Your yeah, opinion. Yeah. We'll have time. To so we, we st we've just started a performance. Yeah, th yeah, this yeah. is maybe not the one you, you planned. But <laughs> he's the camera, he's the director. Uh, actually, I have a question uh, about uh, 16 millimeter film and film and like film as a film print and film as a something material and then turn to digital, digital because you work in both. And uh, now, because I run a cinema in <laughs> in Warsaw, and uh, we screen experimental and so on, and I noticed that nowadays, like 16 millimeter uh, print, could be some kind of fetish uh, or something like that. And and I want to ask, what, what do you think? Like, is it um, I don't know, uh, is it worth to make movies on 16 millimeters, or this is some kind of fetish or some vintage thing now or how about digital uh, techniques in your work and so on like yeah I'm interested in that turn and like usage of uh, prints now because like there are like uh, tons of um, experimental film fans even young and so on they are still making films on eight millimeters and 60 millimeters like some it's just super hip uh, right now and yeah I wanted to ask you as a legend <laughs> of it what do you think okay, the legend speaks. <laughs> Okay, Grandma Hammer says, <laughs> I like, uh, you know, to learn new things. So, I mean, I would love to learn coding so that I could make my own codes for my camera or my computer. Um, so if I'm getting the early Amiga computer, I teach myself the paint program, but I bring it into my personal life. And it was so immediate, but I had to bring in film too. So I projected film onto the television screen and refilmed it. So I was trying to marry, um, you know, film and digital. Um, with this performance coming up, you know, I could, we're gonna project Sanctus on an inflated 10 foot weather balloon. So I could project 16 millimeter, which is so much more beautiful and strong, but it is so much easier to shape with the program Mad Mapper the digital projection so it goes straight onto the balloon without an overlap. And it's a light projector to carry there. You know, I was never successful with the projection with 16, even if I tried to make some way to shape the light um, of the film. So, you know, I embrace both. I mean, yes, I guess it could be considered fetish um, but on the other hand, there are people still working in it, not as a fetish, but as a form of expression. And you know, when photography came along, people thought painting would be dead. It's just that old story. There's room for everything. There's room for every genre of film. There's room for every medium of making film, and they can be brought together. So I like them all, and they all have different qualities. So we have one more question, please. I would like also ask about the political effect of your movies. Are there any political effect? What do you think about it? What about the political effect of my movies? Well, a long time ago, we showed Dyke Tactics in a wom program, a woman's cinema, shorts, in a commercial theater. The audience was, you know, all pretty much all women, not all. And a woman started crying behind me, tears were coming, or no, she was in front of me, tears were coming from her face. And so the friend I was with and I, we took her out to the lobby of the theater and we asked, what's the matter? And she said, I think I'm a lesbian. So I think this is the most political act I've done. <laughs> Thank you. You know, some people in Poland uh, say that you can really promote being homosexual, which is quite funny. We have this uh, ret all rhetoric yeah. of homosexual lobby yeah. and homosexual homosexual promotion. Oh, my favorite, the last one, homosexual imperium, yeah. which wants to, you know, seduce you and make you gay. Yeah. So this is what, what I really try to do with my students. I'm trying to promote... Uh, encourage them, you know, 
become homosexuals, become uh, blacks, become colored, okay? Become <laughs> different. Become a woman. <laughs> become a woman. <laughs> become, <laughs> like. I'm, my name's Bob Hammer. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a lot of fun, you guys. I don't know. I got to get back to work. See you later. Right? <laughs> okay. So, thanks a lot. This was a splendid evening. So, uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, <laughs> thank you. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Dziękuję Państwu za przybycie w ten ponury październikowy wieczór.